Are you ready to live in a world where most of the choices are made by machines? Are you aware of the choices that are already being made by machines? And do you trust people like me to help those machines make better choices than they're making right now? When I say artificial intelligence, I am not talking about the potential sci-fi future of superintelligence that tries to take over the planet. The kind of thing we've been dreading since 1927's Metropolis, where we're wondering, is, is every job going to go away? Or maybe 1984's The Terminator, where we're wondering, maybe every human will go away. I am talking about the kind of technology that we have available to us right now, the kind of things that is in emerging medical technology, imaging recognition things that are in your pocket, like Siri, things that are choosing what you see when you go home tonight, like on Netflix and YouTube, capabilities that are going to be baked into real-world applications that could touch millions of jobs, hundreds of millions of lives, and change how we are every day, like autonomous retail, as you might have seen in the Amazon Go store that's now open in Seattle, or maybe autonomous vehicles that we've been hearing about so much and we're very excited to see take shape. We are now in a new era that is very popularly being called intelligent transformation. The fact of the matter is, the last three years, or at least five years, of marketing of IT services has revolved around this term digital transformation. And the fact of the matter is, we are only at the beginning of digital transformation. Most people believe that because every worker has a laptop now, or maybe just a mobile phone, most, or because every company has at least a server doing email, it means that digital transformation has happened. Okay? The fact of the matter is, digital transformation is only about, of work done in America, only about 18% of it has been digitized or machine-assisted in some way. In Europe, it's actually even lower. It's only 12%. Okay. We're actually riding a tidal wave that's moving very quickly, and the fact of the matter is that artificial intelligence is going to accelerate an already very open market, something that is, seems like it might be stagnant to individuals who are inside of it, but are actually changing incredibly rapidly. Okay. Artificial intelligence software is largely controlled by about seven companies in the world. Okay. Most of them are familiar to you. The one that's probably not familiar to you is Baidu, which is the largest Chinese AI company. And most importantly, two of which are here in Washington, Amazon and Microsoft. As we progress into the age of intelligent transformation, these companies will be increasingly more valuable, even though some of them are already coming, have surpassed or are coming near the $1 trillion valuation that people once thought was well, impossible. Uh, and that technology is going to filter down into other, into other companies, accelerating their digitization where some companies will have never had digital technology, they'll just have quote-unquote intelligent technology. McKinsey actually estimates that 70% of companies by the year 2030 will adopt artificial intelligence in some form, and those key forms that are, that, that arrival is going to have a massive impact in the total economy of the world. If not every life, then certainly every business, and potentially, probably every dollar. If we put this into absolute terms of history, this is more than the Industrial Revolution. From a GDP impact, the steam engine, if you take one steam engine worth of technological impact back in the 1800s, you can actually look at the rise of digital transformation and the availability of technologies like the internet, mobile devices, and computing. That was actually worth about two steam engines from a GDP growth standpoint. How much is AI worth? Artificial intelligence is actually worth four steam engines worth of progress as far as GDP impact between now and 2030. As it grows beyond that, it's almost impossible to estimate because that is, that is definitely in the realm of potentially pure science fiction. And the fact of the matter is, there's, it, is it is completely inevitable, and there's going to be a lot of rush. There's going to be a lot of economic pressure. The force of capitalism will make it so everyone adopts it because of the powerful competition. There are probably five key areas of artificial intelligence in the near term that every, that every company will likely be adopting. Voice recognition, such as we see in Amazon's Alexa, Microsoft's Cortana, Siri. Uh, visual vision, computer vision, where particularly the key, the key component of autonomous vehicles. 
Uh, virtual assistants, the area that LiveTiles is moving into specifically, as we transform from a software company to an artificial intelligence company, it is through the technology of virtual assistants. Uh, robotic automation, which is going to go from what we're familiar with from, say, the 80s or 90s, into a whole new level of particularly training autonomous robots that can be used in many forms, trained extremely quickly because of newly available AI, and will we'll make it so even more jobs are lost out of the manufacturing sector. Finally, the broad scope of machine learning. And machine learning is the key area, the key application that I am going to speak to you about today. It has the largest impact as far as what is possible with this kind of three key areas of creating bias in the world. Okay? The perception of the world at scale, the prediction of the future based on the past, and the decisions of people, potentially decisions made completely autonomously, autonomously uh, shaping and reshaping the future. Yep. So, foundationally, I'm sure all of us are uncomfortable with the idea of machines making choices for us. Even though we hope the number of choices in our life are actually increased by, by machines rather than decreased. The fundamental ethical dilemma is not that these things are dangerous. It is that they are dangerously neutral with likely bias or aloof creators operating out of and into an at best flawed and potentially misinformed society growing ever more dependent on them. It is not something that is inherent to the machine, but it is something that we need to take responsibility for. As my friend John Roach, who I, we were in telepathic communication the other day and we both decided to include the same book in our presentations. Uh, if you want to know the story so far on the, the, the step one, Step one on understanding, on understanding machine ethics is machines only understand math. Reducing human welfare or human, or human influence into just math is very quickly the root of all evil. Okay? If you want to talk about the story so far of reducing people into numbers and how that's harmful to society, you should read the book Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, which talks about how the financial sector is exploiting each one of us, having created, for instance, credit scores that now inform employers, credit scores that now inform insurance companies, just as one pure example of how the history of particularly the 20th century and before informs this burgeoning 21st century where our, our ability to see the world at scale is going to make it so each of us are just tiny pixels and being moved along a map, changing coordinates because we're just a, piece, we're just a set of numbers. Okay? The one that I'm going to talk about today is actually the choice one. Okay? also called the trolley problem. Do we have audio? And on the track ahead of you are five workmen that you will run over. Now, you can steer to another track, but on that track is one person you would kill instead of the five. What do you do? Do we know anything about the people? Like, is one of them an ex-boyfriend? Or that snooty girl from Rite Aid who was always silently judging my purchases? It's like, yeah, chicky, a baby Ruth and birth control. I see the irony. Keep a swipe and... You don't know any of the workers. Okay, well, then that's easy. I switch tracks. Kill one person instead of five. But this is hard, because the only trolley I've ever been on is James Franco's ironic trolley. It travels backwards from his penguin grotto to his garage of adult tricycles. Um, go on, say five. Good, but there's a lot of other versions of this. Like, what if you knew one of the people? Does that change the equation? Or what if you're not the driver, you're just a bystander? Or let's throw the trolley out altogether. Let's say you're a doctor and you can save five patients, but you have to kill one healthy person and use his organs to do it. But that's not the same thing. Why not? It's still choosing to kill one person to save five, isn't it? Michael. You've been kind of quiet. What do you think about all this? Well, obviously the dilemma is clear. How do you kill all six people? So I would <laughs> dangle a sharp blade out the window to slice <laughs> the neck of the guy on the other track as we smoosh our five main guys. <laughs> oh, I did the thing again, didn't I? Yep, 10 more, buddy. People good, people good. Why is that so hard to remember? People, what is it? Good, good. So that is, that is spoilers for season two of The Good Place, one of my favorite shows because it deals with what takes you to heaven and what takes you to hell. 
It turns out it's your choices. Uh, my other favorite thing about that line is when she says that thing about the woman silently judging me at Rite Aid, it turns out Rite Aid is actually silently judging you and then re-advertising to you based on those judgments, just so you know. <laughs> All right. Fundamentally, the trolley problem is a hundred, uh, hundreds or so year old ethical dilemma around how do you decide? In, in, even if the question is not what should you do best, the, the, other, the other phraseology that you might be more familiar with it, I, would be, if you flip the switch and it does kill one person, are you a murderer? Uh, I'm not going to answer that. It's up to you. Let's talk about it later. Uh, the, the fact of the matter with AI is not, is not just that there are lives involved, um, not to get too grim, but if you do support autonomous vehicles, or you think you might want one, or that you did buy a Tesla, and I'm, I'm very excited to hear that, um, they're going to kill humans by the hundreds of thousands. But it's only because we've been killing each other by the millions on the highways every day. Okay? Uh, I'm going to talk about something a little less grim than that in an, in an attempt to make the, the talk a little bit happier, particularly what's on the track. What's on the track is not always lives. It is perhaps more importantly jobs and equality. And seeing as how not all of you are creating AI technology, but all of you are consuming technolo AI technology, I'm going to actually talk about equality, even though it seems like the least harsh one. It has the most interesting modern equivalents. We have about a few good cases in the last few years. So, strap into your Tesla, let the robot hold on to the switch for a, little, for a minute, and let's try to think about how have machines been solving the, the trolley problem with the choices they've already been making? Okay. Keeping in mind that machines are inherently neutral. So MIT did this great experiment. They called it Norman. They took a single, al a single algorithm, a way of putting together a model for language based on an image. It is the same algorithm. They fed it two separate data sets for two separate trainings. One was a, sta a standard set of image annotations from a large Stanford repository of images. One was pulled from a cesspool of internet social networking called Reddit. Okay. They fed it that information, and they, as they claim, they made the world's first psychopathic AI. They showed, this AI, they showed this AI a classic psychological test called the Rorschach test, where you, sh you show you know, vague, poorly defined images. Vague and poorly defined in the way that like, most important things in life are, seeing as how most choices are not mathematical. When it tried to distill the pixels down into something mathematical and correlate it, it would, it would give out a sentence. So the regular one would give something like, a group of birds sitting on top of a tree branch. And then the psychopath would say something like, a man is electrocuted and catches to death. Not great grammar structure, but a little bit dark. And they had a whole series of these, where ultimately the AI is not a result of the algorithm itself. It is primarily a result of the training set. The training set is what we'll really dwell on today, of how it's like, how do you get an actual pure world, or how do you get a pure algorithm when you don't have a pure world? Thus introducing the, the negative cases of when machine learning meets equality. Okay? To give you a small primer, there are two forms of training for, for a, a model. These two forms, the only thing you need to remember out of this process is unsupervised and supervised. Unsupervised does not mean unaccountable. Okay? Unsupervised just means the, the humans did not intervene on the creation of the model. Okay? In an unsupervised environment, a data set is fed into the machine, the machine is left to do its own correlation, clustering the information as it sees in the raw data. Then potentially, taking in, when it takes in new images, it can then re realign you along the clusters. Basically, taking a large set of data and sorting it based on whatever math mathematical qualities things have in common. Okay? So fundamentally, when you have an unsupervised algorithm, there still has to be some sort of reward mechanism or, or, or rating mechanism. Okay? Unfortunately, in the modern world, in the most, or in the current world, most of these are actually based on a revenue model or business model run by the company. So let's give the monopoly man the switch and see what he does with his terrible indifference. Uh, so a good one would be the guidance of online advertising. Online advertising is hundreds of billions of dollars in a year. Okay? Google is probably the largest. They take in $89 billion worth of advertisements, guiding billions of people to their destinations on the web. As you know, most of the, the way they make money at it is showing you ads ahead of, 
ahead of other more relevant, objectively scored web pages. Okay? Around 2015, there was a discovery, there was a discovery made with an inc by uh, Georgetown University, okay? where they realized that African Americans were actually being targeted by the Google AdWords system, even though AdWords does not allow you to target my demographic. It was simply a response, an, un, an unsupervised response from the algorithm, realizing that the conversion rate on African Americans was, and, and Latinos was actually much higher than whites. And the system is attempting to optimize not on equality, but on the amount of money that it makes. Therefore, it started racially targeting uh, based on information where, according to, their, according to their rules, that does not happen. Okay? They did, in 2015, re, uh, restructure the algorithm, make it so this doesn't happen. If you actually search for the same keyword now, need cash now, there are no ads allowed on payday loans anymore. This is actually a good example of payday loans are technically legal. I would, people would argue that they are immoral. Ads for people getting information, very illegal. I would argue, maybe immoral in some cases. The intersection of that becomes highly immoral. Okay? It is kind of, to put it in IT sense, it is kind of like how when you have a 99% availability system and a 99% availability system, what is the availability of those systems? It multiplies together and it becomes like 97, okay? It is like that, where the total morality score just caves through the, roof, caves through the floor, okay? There are systems that use unsupervised algorithms that actually tell you, in an, in an attempt at transparency, they tell you the features that they have. This is actually my, un, most of this I did not tell Facebook. This is my Facebook tags that they have put into the system. Um, there is a tag that tells you how much money I make. It deduced that. I'm not going to show it to you, because that, be, that would be rude. Um, but it does know that I travel, for instance. It does know that I'm often away from my family. Uh, yes, it shows me ads from time to time that target a person who might be psychologically lonely, but it's not quite the same thing. It turns out that there's other, other tags that they do not show you, and one of them actually happens to be mental health status. Based on your posts, it can check if you have either a depressive or manic phase going on in your, in, your in your text that you're entering into Facebook. And up until 2017, they actually did have that running through their ad targeting network as an emergent property of the unsupervised algorithm running. This, for instance, was a, a Vox Media reporter who was suffering a depressive episode that lasted about six months and tracking it over time. These were the ads that she was shown across Instagram and Facebook, all things that absolutely were targeting her and biasing her based on her mental health status, but were, again, supposedly not part of the framework of advertising uh, presented by the platform. Okay? So maybe you think, maybe you think, Eric, unsupervised, that sounds dangerous. We need to keep an eye on the machines. If we just keep an eye on the machines, everything will be fine. Okay? Uh, so there is a thing that you're thinking of. There's a thing called supervised learning. Okay? In supervised learning, you're, you're handed a data set, but the data set is annotated by a human. Okay? It has some sort of, there's some sort of value on the other end. Okay? You take warehouses with square footage, it's, it's, it's a school system, and how much it's worth, and then given enough of those, I can actually tell you how much, how much a regular house is worth. Uh, that, is, that is how you know, websites like Trulia and Zillow work. They've been running regression models for decades based on supervised learning in order to project something like the value of a house. We could try to argue as to whether or not they're part of the inflation of the real estate market over the last decade since digital technology was invented, but that's kind of a hairy scenario, so I'm not going to go into that one. Uh, I will say that in this scenario, the, the trolley problem changes a little bit different. Instead of saying capitalism takes the switch, it's actually history at large. Okay? And the sad, the sad fact of the matter is our history is... Our history is not ideal, therefore the future will, could be forever shackled by it. So suppose, I have inoculated you somewhat against the rise of the AI apocalypse, Suppose, but not completely. Suppose I was sitting you down and you were going to put together a hiring algorithm at a company that's going to look at resumes and attempt to tell you whether or not they'd be a good candidate. Okay? What would be the things that you look at Someone trying to hire. You might do something like look at the experience and try to figure out, have they done something like this such that they could do it again? Okay? I might look at their education and think, oh, did they go to a good university? Okay? Uh, maybe, maybe I might look at their introduction and be like, do they seem really passionate about this job? Um, and there are companies who actually did this. There are companies who, who took the database of resumes that they already had, 
they looked at the, the ones that led to an interview and the ones that led to a hiring, and they correlated them together and made it so instead of looking at millions of resumes, you had to look at thousands of resumes of the best quality candidates machine learning could give you. So what were the qualities? That, they ran with this for a while. It did not go well. What were the two qualities that they, it turns out they were actually scoring people on? Any guesses? Who saw, that, who saw the documentary Freakonomics or read the book? First one would be the name. Ethnic sounding names get rejected offhand by HR people. Uh, you could argue not purposefully, but, but uh, yes. Ethnic sounding names get bounced out of the system incredibly rapidly. What is the other thing on this resume? And again, I've made it very simple. The, it's just a couple set of numbers. Okay? The zip code. Okay? The zip code of the person in the resume was an absolute predictor of socioeconomic status therefore education and capability, therefore ability to move through the system to get into the company and move up inside the company. Okay? And it's because you get to see the bigger world. I could never, with supervised data, explain to an algorithm, by the way, we live in this country where we've divided people into class and race into little bento boxes that are you know, congressional districts and counties and states and zip codes and things like that. There's no way to teach that to an algorithm. Okay? These top-level sociological issues can't be filtered down into a system, and you can't just make a principle, you can't, you can't just make, hand over a principle like you would to a person saying, don't discriminate based on geography. Yeah. So again, I was in psychic communication with John Roach, if you saw John Roach's uh, talk. So Joy Bulamini, Bulamini uh, takes, is a researcher at MIT who takes a slightly different slant on the same problem. She actually talks about the limitation of training sets. Okay. So that was a bad training set. It was like, what if we had, well, bad training sets. But there are certain things where it's like, no matter the training set, like the accuracy is still good. And you're like, well, actually, the variety and, ver and veracity of the training set really, really matters. Joy does a lot of research into um, the, the, life, the life of gender and race. Okay. It turns out, did you know that according to Microsoft, this is a really terrible thing in America, according to, according to IBM and Face++, and a dark-skinned woman is only found two-thirds of the time. And I will tell you that Americans should be very wary of anything that will, tr that will treat a black woman as three-fifths of the person. Just saying that's bad. Again, something I can't explain to the machine. So what would be some factors, some key factors that you would be striving for? And there are four, there are four pillars to it. If you had audible algorithms, algorithms where you could actually crack them open and see what they're doing inside, with an unbiased data set, with an accountable behaviors, and I could monitor and attempt to ret ret retroactively determine what it was doing, with quite critically making reversible decisions, I could theoretically make an AI that is not dangerous, that is not inherently dangerous. The challenges to that are many, and, you would have to, and data scientists around the world are working very hard on it. So what are the influences that attempt to get us to this unbiased future? So there's a handful. I know most of you are not going to be creators of AI, but all of you are going to be consumers of AI. As consumers, you're voting with your dollars on what should persist in the marketplace. Okay? You should try to examine the company and figure out, do they have an ethics policy? Do they have an history of following it? Okay? There are, there's, there's things like Microsoft has this great framework called Fate. It's very good. Um, and then try to examine the actual behavior of the company. Earlier this year, Google, Google gave up on a government contract around image recognition for drones because it was violating, violating a moral code they had laid out that AI should not be used for weaponry. They walked away from, from millions, if not tens of millions of dollars, all in the pursuit of being more ethical rather than more rich. That is the kind of behavior that you want to see in your vendors. So Sharon Brown, not here anymore, is here anymore. Uh, so government, government is actually the, the natural thing. Like they, they regulate. The problem with government, and there is a role, there is a role for them in some industries, so I'm not going to completely bag on them. But the timing of it, it's going to, we're going to achieve this exponentially while the legislators are moving linearly. Okay? It's going to, it, they're not going to be able to stop us, they're not going to be able to stop the AI from doing certain things in a timely manner. Um, legislative understanding of technology issues is really terrible too. It has basically been a terrible year for US federal policy on technology. Uh, we lost net neutrality. Thanks to this, this guy with this stupid grin. Um, you know, those legislators who are trying to talk Mark Zuckerberg into like not, not propagating uh, you know, evil and not like destroying democracy. If you listen to the talks that they were giving, you're like, no, this is not going to work. Uh, Grandpa is not going to be able to pick apart a multi-billion dollars, um, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of value with billions and billions of users asking softball questions that reveal they don't know how the internet works. Okay? There are countries that are ahead of the curve. For instance, 
Germany already has excellent autonomous vehicle regulation in place. They are ready for, it, for autonomous vehicles in a way like uh, no other country is. Their foundation in the automotive industry was, made them culturally ready, you could argue, but I would actually say it's because they have preemptive and working government. Similarly in the EU, there was something enacted this year called the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. GDPR does not specifically call it artificial intelligence. However, there's a couple of key provisions in it that are useful to data sets and big data. One of them is the right to be forgotten. Each of us should have the ability to remove ourselves from the data set for a supervised or unsupervised algorithm. That single provision, if we could get it into every, maybe every state or, or all across the country, would be the single best thing out of GDPR that we could implement, if, if not this whole framework. And they're going to have a next step. Like EU is going to come after AI next um, to balance it out. The final one would be what all of you can do today. There's already things inside of companies that take a risk-based risk approach to monitoring technology, stopping the exploitation of users, and providing best practices to developers and admins. What is that thing? Cybersecurity. Yeah. If you have someone versed in cybersecurity, okay, or a moment to think about cybersecurity, please at least, this is not exactly the same thing, but consider AI ethics in the same framework of cybersecurity where you have to get, start thinking about the pitfalls, start following up on scenarios. To get you started, you should go over to ethicalos.org. They have eight risk zones with a set of scenarios around them to, to think about where things could go wrong. Some of them are kind of sci-fi and kind of fun. Some of them are now, clear and present dangers. Uh, the other one would be, if you're going to engineer a system, the IEEE is working on standards for AI ethics. You can go to their website and you can look through a dozen or so standards that they're working on, including transparency, algorithmic bias, they're trying to tackle this. They're one of the only transnational organizations tackling it in a good industry-focused way. If you're creating an AI system, go look at ethicsinaction.ieee.org. Uh, and finally, uh, when you're thinking about the trolley problem, I still am fundamentally optimistic about the nature of machine learning. Okay? We don't have to give up control to the robots. You don't have to throw away your Tesla, but we do have to make sure that humans are still in control. So now again, do I ask you, are you ready for a world where most decisions are made by machines? Are you aware of the decisions already being made? And are you ready to trust people like me to make the systems that will decide the future? So, thank you.